Hey guys, Jeremy here, and just giving a little bit of intro to this. This is my interview with Pete Williams. This was supposed to be able to play on my radio show last week, last Saturday, but for some reason there was a bit of a programming issue. It will be playing on air next week, but this is the full unedited interview, and I just really hope you guys uh, give this a listen. Pete was a great interviewee. We had a really great conversation talking about the show's history, the history of undergrads itself, what he has been doing, kind of the, the strife and the challenges that he went through after the show was canceled and gives a little bit of in-depth about what he did to kind of overcome that. And then obviously, of course, we talk about the Kickstarter and the programs and all the other things that are going to be part of this whole Kickstarter and what happens once and hopefully this Kickstarter is successful. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview and uh, yeah, enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to Listening to the Movies, the show where we play classic hits from great film soundtracks. You're listening to us on 101.7 CIVL-FM or on www.civl.ca. Reporting to you from the University of the Fraser Valley, Abbotsford Campus, on the unceded and traditional territory of the Stolo people, I am your host Jeremy and we have a very, very special guest today. The man I am interviewing is the creator of the classic technically kind of Canadian cartoon show that had its one and only season premiere in 2001 and Teletoon ran reruns of it for over 10 years. The show was a classic embodiment of the early 2000s and was a big underground hit for many Canadian fans. And now it is getting its return in the form of a movie. You may recognize my host's voice as the character's nits, Cal or Gimpy, but today he is undergrad show creator Pete Williams. Pete, thank you for being on the show. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that intro. It was amazing. Great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show, sir. And like I said, uh, congrats so far about how the Kickstarter is going so far. In less than half a week, you've already pretty much reached the halfway point of the goal. Yeah, I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty blown away by that, to be honest. Uh, we, had, we didn't really know what kind of reaction we were going to get. Uh, so this has been amazing. The outpouring of support from fans has really, has really been unreal. I can only imagine. Were you expecting that much of a response so quickly? Not really. I thought this was going to take some time to, to, to grow and build. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it's it's going to start petering off at some point. Uh, I feel like you know I'm hoping we didn't just blow our wad at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> you no. Know, I mean, certainly it, it exceeded my expectations of the first week, uh, without a doubt. Oh, extremely. Like at first, when I I've literally just been like bringing it up over and over again just to see where it is in the process, and I think the first few hours I was like, oh, hmm, that's a. That's a little slow. Hopefully, it'll keep on getting traction. And then all of a sudden, two people bought the character and voice uh, rewards, and that poofed it up. That was a big shocker, man. I really, I thought, oh, that's got to be a family member of mine. You know, <laughs> bidding on those. There's, there's no way a complete stranger would bid that much. But uh, lo and behold, yeah, they, they were they were taken by two uh, two fans that just really want to. Uh, to be a, a you know a voice in the movie which is awesome that is that is fantastic so as uh, we've discussed for this interview we're going to kind of cover if three main topics uh the first being kind of just a reminiscent run through with the show uh, how you were when you got the chance to win like when you won the contest and you got to create your own show kind of the falling out of that and then we'll ask uh questions about kind of what you've been up to and sort of your process as being an animator, and then we'll obviously talk a few, uh, talk a little bit about the Kickstarter movie and what you can and can reveal about that. Excellent. So the Too many first, about me. sorry. Too many questions about me. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. No, I. That's one thing I wanted to do. I've seen uh, some interviews talk about kind of the show's status, and then also about. Um, what's happening with the movie, but I always really like getting the more personal questions about the people who are behind it, because sometimes they're just kind of a face, but you want to know more of like the ups and downs, the career choices and whatnot of the person who created a show that's literally been a staple mark for me and many other people for so long. All right, absolutely. I'll do my best. Oh, it's going to be great. So now... Undergrads was obviously about four best friends and the challenges and courses that they went through. Well, the courses of uh, their choices with uh, uh, group pressure, uh, alcoholism, uh, kind of group acceptance. 
all about kind of the community aspects of college life, yet you never really ever saw any of them take classes. So my first question is, what were the guys in the clique going to school for? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so NITS, we always assume, was just undeclared. We, uh, you know, for in the beginning stages of development, we thought maybe he would be a film major, um, just because that's what I, I was going to school for. Um, but we were we were afraid of you know pigeonholing him and then and making him less relatable to you know students that weren't pursuing you know a film career. <laughs> and we really wanted Nitz to be kind of that everyman and and be the character that that folks could relate to. And so we decided we'll just make him undeclared, and that way it's it's pretty open ended. Um, and also it, it fits with his character cause he's just, he doesn't know what he wants. Um, Gimpy was of course studying, you know, computer science. Um, he's, he's pretty obvious. Cal was a drama major, which is why we saw him hanging out with, you know, Kimmy Burton and, 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 uh. and the drama guy, uh, all the time. Um, Rocco school probably didn't have majors. Uh, <laughs> and, and that certainly wasn't his reason for going to college. Uh, he had other extracurricular activities in mind, but we do know that Rocco was studying uh, abnormal psychology uh, because we saw him with the abnormal psychology textbook uh, in the in yes the he oh recondition uh, recondition Cal <laughs> oh yeah hey best buddy guy oh um, so then uh, you say uh, like a big thing about the history of this show is that all these character uh, the three characters other than Nitz were based off of your best friends and. During a uh, talk you had at a, a conference, you said that the friends were originally taken aback by the traits, uh, taken aback by these characters that you based their traits off of. How was that process like with them? Because eventually you said that they were a little bit kind of apprehensive, but then they came to, you know, they were happy with it. You were, they let you do it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they were ever happy with it, um, but they, uh, they, they were supportive of it. Let's put it that way. But yeah, initially... Um, you know, when I did my initial contest entry, I showed it to the three of them because uh, we were all, you know, home for winter break. And, you know, they laughed. They thought it was funny. But uh, the, the friend that Cal is based on uh, was just kind of silent. Uh, he, uh, you know, he, <laughs> I don't think he saw the humor in it because it's a, it's a pretty awful, awful impression of him. Um, and it's an impression that, that, that we all kind of created um, and had been, had been imitating him for years. Uh, even prior to the contest, so it was uh, it was an impression that I had perfected certainly. Uh, oh, that point. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he wasn't happy with that uh, when when we did the, uh, the the animated pilot when it was finally in development at MTV. I then you know gathered them together, showed them the animated pilot. Uh, the real Rocco thought it was hilarious. Uh, you know, the real Gimpy was kind of indifferent, but again, the real Cal was was I. <laughs> I think he was a bit hurt by it, um, uh, and I just had to kind of, you know, <laughs> explain that this isn't you. It's this. It's this alternate universe version of you. You know, it is, <laughs> it is taking these few tiny qualities that we've, you know, that we've pointed out time and time again, and kind of blown them up and exaggerated them. Uh, but uh, you know, there, there's a lot more to the real Cal. Uh, this, you know, Cal is definitely just an impression of this friend more than the friend himself. Ah, uh, okay. Um, speaking of Rocco, I know that due to the CRTC rules with creating the show, a Canadian actor voiced Rocco. But the problem is, yeah. I've I've never found out who his name is, and I guess will he be returning for the movie? So I mean, my hope is that we we bring back as many of the original cast members as possible. That's certainly the goal. Um, you know, some of them may be tricky, uh, like um, Yannick Besson, who's who's you know, the star of Murdoch Mysteries now. Uh, he was the voice of uh, Kruger and Stoner Dave. Oh. Um, and uh, he may he may be too he may be too big of a star for us at this point. But we'll see we'll see we'll see if we can get him back. Um, but as far as Canadian Rocco. I believe he was voiced by an actor named James Key, um, and uh, and James Key was also the voice of the character of uh, Riley on Quads, which was which was another animated show that that shared the uh, the Teletoon Detour block. Um, so if I have if I have the right name, because I never actually met the actor who played uh, Canadian Rocco, his voice was replaced uh, you know, after 
sort of all my voice record stuff had been completed and the show was in post-production at that point. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that's something that uh, when I did a video kind of doing a retrospective of the history of undergrads, I couldn't find his name for the life of me. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know why. I mean, well, it's, it's hard to decipher from the credits because the credits don't really list them by character. But, uh, I'm, you know, I had to ask my wife because my wife was also uh, was a production coordinator on the show at the time. And, uh, and I was like, who is the, who is the voice of Rocco? And, uh, she was, she was confident it was James Key. And when I looked him up and then I saw he had done another voice on quads, I'm really listening. I'm like, oh yeah, I can kind of hear Rocco in there. So, uh, I'm going with James Key. Oh, okay. Um, and then how did it feel for the show to end how it did both I, with the American early cancellation on TV and then the show itself on a, the sophomore cliffhanger? It felt great. No, <laughs> it was it was awful. Um, you know, we when we when we came up with that cliffhanger, you know, myself and the other writers all thought that it was you know just guaranteed that we were going to get another season, um, and and just the, the the thought never crossed our minds that that this wouldn't continue on. So when the show was canceled, uh, it was it was certainly a, a, a blow. Um, and, you know, I, I just remember the day that I went to, you know, to MTV studio and my, my access card didn't work and it was like, oh, okay. I guess that's, that's an indication of what's going on here. Um, but yeah, it was, what was really sad is that, you know, that the, sh the show was canceled on MTV only six episodes in, so it didn't even get to complete its run. And so, you know, I was, I was certainly devastated and, and, uh, and out of a job and, um, you know, I had a, a fairly expensive apartment that I could no longer afford. Uh, and so I ended up moving back with my parents um, and, and, you know, kind of curled up into a ball to lick my wounds and figure out what I was going to do next. And um, this was before the show, you know, even aired on uh, Teletoon up in Canada. So, there, you know, I had this whole other chance to find an audience that I wasn't I wasn't aware of. I just at, at that point in time, I just assumed this is a complete failure and I need to, you know, I need to move on. Uh, and that kind of leads me into one of my personal questions about you. For someone your age, like at the time, you were in your early 20s, right? When you had this show being given to you, like you won it and then you got to create this whole show and then it obviously and it falls down in front of you. So like, how was it like that for someone at your age to deal with those ups and ultimate downs? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think, I think what helped me get through it certainly was a certain amount of naivete um, because, you know, I was young and so I did still feel like I got my whole life ahead of me, you know? Um, I was essentially the age that I would have been had I just, you know, graduated college. Um, it, it probably would have been a tougher pill to swallow if I was, you know, if I had been older and, you know, and, and, and kind of built up a career over time. And this kind of felt like the end of that career, whereas I was still still new to the business, still still a young guy. And so I, I did feel like I still had a lot of, you know, opportunities ahead of me. I just needed to find a way to create those opportunities. And that uh, kind of brings up a good point that I really wanted to ask you. What kind of advice could you give to young and up-and-coming filmmakers and animators who can find themselves in similar situations where they have projects canceled on them early in their infancy? How did you deal with that situation kind of mentally and career-wise? Because that's obviously a huge blow to have so early on in your career. It is. I mean, I think you just need to kind of have a certain level of fortitude and stick with itness, and you know, just constantly find a way to rebound and move on. And, and you know, it, if it's, it could be with the same project. You know, uh, undergrads when it began as the click, um, prior to getting greenlit, it it was killed in development at one point, um, and you know, and again, it was it was sort of a situation where I had to, you know, put it down for a little while figure out what I was going to do next um, because at that point I had, I had dropped out of school uh, mm. to, to work on this project at MTV um, and you know I worked on some other things for for the course of a year um, but basically decided I was going to try to you know try to breathe some new life into into the click again and created a new you know promo to, to help to pitch the show and, and pitch the show to other studios not realizing at the time that I actually wasn't legally allowed to do that because MTV owned all the rights 
uh, because of the contest I entered. Um, but I still created this promo and, and pitched it around, and then MTV caught wind of this and said, uh-uh-uh. Um, and, uh, but then they saw the, the new promo and said, oh, yeah, we like that. Let's, let's do something again. And, 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 it, and it revived uh, development on the click, which you know, ultimately led to it getting greenlit. So you know, it, it, it certainly could have died numerous times uh, you know, during development before, you know, before I were going into production. Um, so I do think it is important you know, for creators, don't, you, know, you can't kind of let those rejections get you down initially because they're going to come no matter what. At, you know, if it's not on your first project, it'll be your second or your third. And you just need to find a way to bounce back. And you know, if you feel really strongly about a particular project, you know, find a way to retool it and, 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 and make it more marketable and, and keep going. If you really feel like, you know, <laughs> boy, those executives were right. They just shot my idea full of holes and, and uh, you know, there's no recovery, then move on. You know, there's good, there, you, creators have lots of ideas. And, and I think what I've found from, you know, my friends that are in the business that have been successful is you need to throw a lot at the wall before something sticks. And you need to pitch a lot of material because you're going to get rejected a lot. Oh, and that's very sound advice. Um, one of the things that drew in a lot of Canadian viewers to the show was the show's style of humor. And so some people, like, I've actually got a friend here who asked this question, my friend James. How would you describe the show's brand of humor, and what about it do you think drew in such a cult following? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's... I think it's hard to pinpoint the brand of humor of the show because I really do feel like it is a blend of various brands of humor. Um, you know, certainly with Rocco and Cal, those characters, the humor was obviously very crass. Um, whereas with like Nitz and Jesse, it was a little more dry and sarcastic. With Gimpy, you know, the jokes were far more ridiculous and cartoony and pop, you know, chock full of uh, pop culture references. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, I think what really drew in such a cult following was the fact that beneath all the dick jokes, you know, the, the show did have a heart. And, you know, as, as two-dimensional as they were, you know, these characters, you know, were, were, were characters that the fans grew to care about. Um, and, you know, I think viewers could easily transplant themselves or their own friends, you know, into those situations. Oh, most definitely, Every single character on the show is someone that we've all encountered either in high school or post-secondary life. And probably that familiarity that really gave that kind of reassurance with fans and what drew them into the show. Um, I kind, of, kind of going back to the whole idea of that classes and homework were kind of non-existent really in the show. It, it focus again on every other aspect of college life. Was this intentional? And if so, why? It was yeah. So it was intentional. Um, at the very beginning of development, you know, myself and uh, the, the the other two head writers on the show, you know, we basically came to a decision that we really didn't want to see the inside of a classroom or introduce any like teacher characters or anything like that because that to us that wasn't what the show was going to be about it was going to be about everything else that happens at college which to us was far more interesting than you know studying for a test or or sitting in a lecture hall um you know i i was still sort of at that age i was still in it so i was still of of college age but you know the other two writers were were slightly older and had a little bit more perspective and you know they said you know of, of all the things they remembered from their college experiences uh you know what they were studying uh, or what class they had was not really part of, of that those memories. And speaking of uh, your original writers, Josh Cagnan and Andy Rheingold, you announced in the Kickstarter video that they're coming back. How do they feel about coming back uh, to the Click? Were they kind of surprised that you that uh, that you acquired the the rights after so many years? Um, well, Josh, it's actually Josh Kagan. Kagan, sorry, Kagan. Uh, I had to make sure I corrected it in case he's listening. Um, so, yeah, so Josh and Andy uh, have been involved on and off throughout this entire process. Really, the, this whole thing kicked off back in 2012 uh, when the three of us were invited to do a panel on undergrads uh, in Calgary at a convention. And, you know, the three of us assumed that maybe five people would show up to hear us talk about this, 
you know, this ancient animated series that had, that had been canceled like 10 years prior. Um, but we were happily proven wrong and, and, and overwhelmed by a packed auditorium of folks who turned out, you know, to hear us speak about a show that, you know, that they still cared about. And, you know, I think for us, seeing that real life human beings had actually seen our show and still cared about it sort of lit a fire under our butts. And that's when we started looking at ways to get the rights back. Um, and so, you know, Josh and Andy have been kind of, you know, slightly, you know, a part of that process. And so they've, they've been, they've been kept abreast of what's been going on throughout. And it's, it's been a very long process, that's for sure. And speaking of long processes, so you say that probably about seven, eight years ago is when you really started to push to get the MTV rights back, or sorry, get the rights back from MTV. How, why, um, you've mentioned in previous interviews that the reason why it took so long is that everyone who was associated with MTV at the time of when you made the show has long gone. So was that, and what were other issues in terms of you getting the rights back and why it took such a lengthy time? Yeah, well, so back in, you know, 2012, when we started to, you know, really look at this and, and how we could get the rights back, we were still of the mindset that we were going to try to get the rights to do a second season. And so that was the angle we were approaching things. And what we found was that the rights uh, to the series were split up between two different companies. It was split up between MTV on the American side and on the Canadian side, uh, you know, some of the rights were owned by uh, Decode Entertainment, which is now DHX, but Decode was the Canadian co-producer of the show uh, for that first season. Um, and so we realized we were going to have to basically negotiate with two completely different parties and neither one really wanted to get at the, at the same table with the other um, because not, you know, neither one was really interested in doing it with the other. Um, so it was, we, we realized it was going to be too difficult to try to get a second season going um, because negotiations just were going to go nowhere. So then we found out that the film rights were solely owned by MTV. So if we wanted to make a movie about undergrads, we would only have to deal with <laughs> one set of lawyers um, and so that was the path that we ultimately decided on and then that began the, began the big rabbit hole of, of you know going going down the hole with uh, with MTV's lawyers and and we just kept getting passed from you know one lawyer to another because a lawyer that would be you know sort of working on this with us at MTV they would suddenly leave and be replaced by somebody else and it was uh, it was just a, it was a very long drawn out process. It lasted over the course of, of, of a few years, and um, you know at one point it just because we kept getting passed along from lawyer to lawyer, uh, the, there was a, a breakdown in communication where <laughs> the lawyer who eventually got our, our our negotiation deal thought we only really wanted the name undergrads, and the the the, the deal they put in front of us basically said you can't use any of the characters, you can't use any of the designs like you basically can just use the name undergrads and it can be about college uh and <laughs> oh, wow like, what? uh you know it, i liken it to the you know having a a family member you know taken hostage and you're negotiating their return and you think you're close to finally getting them back and then you get a, a pinky sent in the mail um oh so we had to re-explain what we wanted which was to make a movie with the characters with their names and voices and everything and finally, you know, it, it sunk in, and, and, and we we came to a, an agreement on, on 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 getting those, basically licensing the, the movie rights. Ah, that's definitely a a harsh but kind of true sort of circumstance. I, I'm I'm amazed that it went through so many hoops. Uh, but so now that you say that you're only dealing with just MTV itself, does that mean that MTV is going to have any sort of uh, affiliation with the film itself like this kickstarter is to convince them to kind of finance a project well i mean the kickstarter is basically to convince uh you know whoever we go after for a distribution for the film uh that there is an audience and to you know kind of prove our case um mtv will certainly they will get uh, a shot if they if it's this is something that they wanted to uh you know either air on the channel or or through their you know their movie division um, but at the at the onset, no, their their MTV will not be involved. Um, they don't have any obligation to you know be involved in the production itself. Uh, they're they're just the the licensor of uh, of of the the undergrads uh, name and, uh, and and property. Um, 
so yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. Um, and speaking of you saying like going through at one point when the the negotiations really broke down, we a lot of us were following the Bring Back Underground's Facebook page that you ran. And when I did my research video, I noticed that you hadn't had any activity on that for almost over a year. So I was wondering, is was it around that time, back in like in the middle of 2017, that this is when the negotiations kind of hit their worst point? Yeah, it was, it was one of those situations where, you know, it, it felt like every couple of months it seemed like we were on the verge of getting a deal in place. And so I was, you know, really excited because I'm like, oh boy, I'm going to finally get to, you know, make the announcement on the Facebook page and, and let fans know. And then it would, you know, fall apart or it would, you know, go in the wrong direction or it would just take another three months and we wouldn't hear anything from their lawyers. So it was, you know, it was, it was frustrating. And I, I really did not want to keep making the same post <laughs> on Facebook saying, you know, we're working on it, guys. We're, we're trying to get the rights back because I felt like, you know, everybody was tired of hearing that. You know, they've, they've been listening to me say the same thing for the last you know three or four years so i i, I basically said i wasn't going to post anything again until we got the rights and so that's uh, that's why there was that that very long absence of uh, of anything on the facebook page oh, of course did you ever feel that at a time you thought that you weren't going to get the rights back at all it was certainly a fear of mine yeah i mean because it's it, i didn't really have much of a hand to play you know, MTV certainly held all the cards. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it was just coming up with an amount that we were comfortable paying them to license, you know, the, the property back. Mm. And what kept you motivated, really, to get those fan- get your characters back? Well, I mean, it, it's something that I've wanted for the last 17 years, certainly. Um, and you know, not only you know for myself because I do still. I, I do still love these characters. I mean, it helps that they're based on real people in my life, but um, I do have a lot of love for you know the characters, for the show, for for all the opportunities that the show gave me. You know, beyond you know 2001, um, and but aside from that, I mean, the fan support throughout the last 17 years has just been amazing. I've, I you know I all the time. I will either run into somebody or I'll get a message from someone and they will, you know, talk about how, you know, how much they love the show. Um, and it's always a surprise to me because I always forget that people saw it because I'm still in that mindset that the show was canceled on MTV and that was it. But um, it, it, it does pop up in my life every now and then. And, and when it does, I'm like, yeah, I really, I feel bad that I couldn't, you know, finish that story, at least, at least the storylines that we had set up in, in that first season. Uh, and, and I really, you know, would, would relish the opportunity to tie up those loose ends for, for the fans. And that brings me into actually my next question. Since the show was canceled in between that time, it's been 17 years. How often did the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, how often did the topic of undergrads, the show itself, the cancellation and people just wanting a second season get brought up by your friends and, and your colleagues and just people you met? How did that feel kind of reliving like the past glories of the show and then also the pains of the show's unfortunate cancellation in those conversations? It, it's certainly always, it's always bittersweet when it comes up because it's, you know, it is, it's, it's nice to hear that either somebody who worked on the show, you know, still remembers it fondly or, you know, there's a, a friend of a friend that, you know, didn't know I was associated with the show that, you know, we're, we're out for drinks and then they find out and they're like, Oh, I used to, I remember watching that on Teletoon and it's just nice. It's nice to hear. It's nice. It's always nice to hear nice things about your, you know, something you worked on. Um, but then at the same time, it is just that reminder of, Oh my God, it's been, it's, it had, it's been that long since, you know, undergrads aired and it's that long that it's kind of lied and waste, uh, you know, collecting dust on a shelf. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've always wanted to uh, finish their story. Um, and so it, it has felt like that, that unfinished business for the last 17 years. But you've had your own little personal meme of, hey, remember only, what's it, only 90s, only 80s, only 70s kids will remember these. And you have your own personal thing with your own creation. Yeah. So... Uh, right now, guys, you if you uh, just tuned in, you are 
on listening to the movies, the show where we play classic hits from great film soundtracks on 101.7 CIVL Radio or on www.civl.ca. We're reporting to you from the University of the Fraser Valley Abbotsford campus, serving Abbotsford, Mission Chilliwack, and surrounding areas on the untraditional, or sorry, on the unceded and traditional territory of the Stolo people. I'm your host, Jeremy, and we are interviewing undergrad show creator Pete Williams. Pete Williams just finally acquired the rights back to his characters after a long, long battle with MTV. And we are getting a movie, hopefully. Uh, he has just started a Kickstarter, and we're interviewing him today, talking about the show, his personal life, and what the Kickstarter holds. So, Pete, we, we've been talking about kind of the, uh, just how the show came about and the kind of the personal strife that you've got uh, you've gone through um i had a f- one more question this is actually from a friend of mine jesse about the show itself obviously the click itself was based on you and your friends and obviously there was very personal characters like characters that you created and you really enjoyed working with but was there a character who was your favorite character outside of the click in the show the Dougler. Um, <laughs> I, I had a I, think, I had a bet that it might have been that one. Yeah, it's. I mean, the Dougler. You know, also because the Dougler was probably one of the few characters that wasn't based on a real person. Uh, the Dougler was sort of an amalgamation of RAs that myself and the other two writers, uh, you know, remember from college. Um, and we just kind of, you know, threw threw their quirks together, and the Dougler was what came out the other end. Um, and he just has a great voice. Uh, he was voiced by uh, Richie Favolaro, who, again, another another great talent that I'm hoping we're going to get back for the movie. Uh, it's kind of like you based the Dougler off of your RA. It's kind of the similar situation how Trey Parker uh, based Mr. Mackey off of a counselor that he had back in his school days. Yes, that's right. So uh, you were saying earlier that when you went to a conference in Calgary, you were astounded at the presence that there was with Canadian fans. Uh, How was it like to find out that your show had developed a cult following in Canada? Because uh, if I'm correct, you didn't know that the show had done its full run on Teletoon for a little while after it had premiered and run its course. So, yeah, I was, uh, so I met my, my future wife on the production of Undergrads. Uh, she was a production coordinator uh, up in, in Toronto on, on the, the on decode side of things. Um, and so we met on that production. I, I, had, I had to come up here for a few months to do oversee post-production on the show. And I'd been up numerous times before that for voice records. Uh, and so we, we hit it off and, and you know, started spending all our time together. And... Um, after you know post production ended, uh, we kind of did the long term, the long distance uh, dating thing. I moved back to New York, and she was still up in Toronto. Um, so she was kind of keeping me apprised of the fact that it was airing on Teletoon. So I knew it was on TV. Um, I just didn't think anybody was watching it. Mm. Um, I knew they played the episodes, and then when I, I ended up eventually moving up to Toronto and moved in with her. Um, and, and was living up here, I would catch it every now and then on, at some ungodly hour on Teletoon. And it's like, oh my God, they're still rerunning this thing. That's, that's crazy. But again, I just assumed it's filler. They're just, they, they need something to fill this, this unpopular time slot. And, uh, and they're just, they, they throw in undergrads in there. I have to admit, I stayed up late all the time when my dad, when I finally got a TV in my room back in my, I think I was in grade seven heading into grade eight. I was told by friends about undergrads and I would stay up late every night I, as many times as I could to watch the show. And eventually I even re- I, I finally started to figure out that, hey, wait a minute, this is just the same episodes I've seen. And eventually I found out that it was only <laughs> one season. But it ran on Teletoon for years, for a, over a decade. I, every time I would like put on Teletoon late at night i'd always be amazed to see undergrads still come up i actually haven't i haven't had cable for the last little while since i've moved out but how that must have been crazy when you saw that they were still doing reruns of it 10 years later oh yeah it was it it was definitely i mean i I mean they played the hell out of it um i just again it was it, it really wasn't until we attended that um that convention in calgary that uh it dawned on us that anybody was actually watching teletoon uh to see those episodes 
man, that's it, it must have been an insane experience uh, considering it's been so long because the show was canceled back in 2001. But as for you, it's been a long 17 years. What have you been up to during that time, both career-wise, family-wise? Just like, what happened to Pete Williams after undergrads? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely uh, my, my career has taken lots of twists and turns. Um, you know, after uh, undergrads ended, I moved back home, and uh, I you know, was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I was fortunate enough to uh, land an agent while I was still uh, at MTV, and so he encouraged me to uh, start coming up with some you know, movie ideas to pitch out in Hollywood. Um, and so I did that for a while, and uh, I would create these kind of animated movie trailers for the ideas that I was pitching uh, to use as kind of a visual aid and, and, and trick Hollywood executives into thinking this was a, a completed project that all they had to do was sign and, and, and turn into money. Um, and so I sold a number of, uh, no, number of you know, high concept uh, movie ideas uh, and, and was paid to write them. Uh, unfortunately, none of those screenplays were ever produced. Um, and eventually, Hollywood decided that they didn't want to <laughs> buy large budget movie ideas that didn't have a pre-existing franchise attached to them. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, reboots and remakes and uh, Marvel movies uh, ended up taking over the landscape completely. Um, and so I had to kind of figure out what I was going to do next. And uh, I, you know, returned to the world of animation. I ended up partnering with uh, a colleague of mine from my MTV days, and we opened up a small. Uh, animation uh, effects studio and mainly did like game trailers for for xbox and some commercial work and, and uh, amusement park attraction installations um and then that eventually segued into another business where we uh, started making these uh stock animated effects uh that we sold to consumers uh to decorate their homes with using video projectors or, or their television uh, that we called Digital Decorations. Um, and that was a company that we started called Atmos Effects, uh, which is still in operation, uh, and, uh, and mainly focused on like Halloween and, and spooky kind of effects, but other holidays as well. Speaking of Halloween, there's a photo of you on uh, one, of your, one of your pages of you with what looks like the, the, uh, the puppet character from the movie Trick or Treat. Am I correct with that? Yes, that is correct. So um, that was uh, that was a product that we produced uh, at Atmos Effects. It was, it was our Trick or Treat digital decoration that we actually licensed uh, from Legendary. And uh, the director of Trick or Treat, Mike Doherty, um, myself and my business partner, Pete Reichert, uh, we had worked with Mike at MTV uh, because he had a show in development at that time. Um, in the in the early 2000s um, for an animated series um, very much in the vein of a trick-or-treat it was like a horror animation uh, animated series um, so we knew Mike and he kind of found our company because he's a huge Halloween fan obviously and he was using our effects to decorate his house uh, and so we kind of linked up with him and he said hey would you want to do something with trick-or-treat and so we're like yes um, and uh, yeah he, he ended up loaning us the actual Sam Halloween costume, the you know the, the little uh, trick or treater character from the movie, um, and we shot these uh, these fun little uh, vignettes uh, for uh, for digital decorations. That's got to be crazy, considering if I'm correct, Mike is directing the next Godzilla movie, is he not? Oh yeah, he's he's huge. He's huge now. Um, I mean, he was he was huge to me even back then. Uh, we we actually both attended uh, NYU Film School, and so he was a couple years ahead of me. But I, I I've known the name Mike Doherty for a very long time. That's nuts. That's so cool to have like experience, like getting to meet someone, also in their infancy in terms of their career. Uh, now we uh, brought up a little bit earlier that you have started a Kickstarter for the uh, the show. Uh, sorry for the f the show getting a revival as a movie. When you were just before you were going to make the Kickstarter, you had a public question out for fans to give their ideas of what rewards were. How did you feel about the response, both with the reward ideas and the inflow of responses? Because you had a, a huge bunch of responses. Oh yeah, I mean the response the responses were amazing. Um, I mean, so many great ideas from folks. But then, and as you pointed out, just the sheer number. Um, you know, certain <laughs> certain reward ideas we would have loved to, to offer, 
um, but they just weren't uh, feasible. You know, a lot of folks were saying, oh, I want, you know, how about a Blu-ray copy of the first season or you know, the first <laughs> season soundtrack on CD? And it's like, I would love to do that if I own the rights, but uh, wah, wah. Um, you know, it was tough enough getting the film rights. Uh, and certainly, certainly, you know, the, the DVD at this point, I, I believe, is extremely rare because only a certain number were produced. I'm actually down to my last copy. I used to have about ten, and you know, kind of given them away over the years. So, it's uh, it, it would be a, an awesome you know uh, reward, but uh, unfortunately, it's just not uh, legal, not legally possible. Speaking of music, the sh- thing that has kind of brought people back a lot to the show uh, is its time, its its datedness. The show premiered 17 years ago. And there was a lot of mannerisms, technology, music, attitudes, and culture that were prevalent during the 2000s. Will that continue over into the movie? Like, not just in terms of where the story is, but just the whole sort of time period that the show was set in. I mean, that's certainly something that we're, we're still kind of grappling with. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's definitely a difference of opinion on this. You know, on the one camp, it's like, do we... Do we take the, you know, is this is this like in the Simpsons universe where Bart Simpson's been in the fourth grade for the last 30 years and Maggie's still sucking on that, uh, you know, that pacifier, even though we've seen the advent of, you know, the Internet and social media and all this other stuff on the show. It's that's a that's a long stretch to be in the fourth grade. Um, but, you know, do we have the summer break for our characters see all these advancements in technology so that when they return, are there, you know, are there iPhones? Are there, you know is their Facebook um, and so we don't know I don't I mean at this point it could go either way um, you know certainly we want this movie to not only appeal to you know the old fans of the show but also speak to a new audience and, and you know and, and to kids that are in college now um, and so there is that you know there's that argument that do we do we catch things up a bit you know in, in not only in, in technology but also pop culture um, you know, have the, have the have the Star Wars movies come out? Um, can we reference those? Uh, or you know, the other side is: do we just set it in the year two thousand and one or two thousand and two, and 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 truly, you know, carry on from that point? Because it's a cartoon, uh, you know, I think we have the leeway to go either way. Uh, but that's uh, it's something that I, I think we're still we're still trying to figure out. Oh, no doubt. That has to be an absolutely daunting kind of question because you want to give something that's satisfactory to the fans of the show. But at the same time, you're kind of caught in that whole, well, if we change it, do we kind of change the essence of the show? Uh, Especially like there's Josh's idea about bringing people back as vampires. And like, what's what did he say? I believe we have a hundred percent chance of alienating not only fans of the old but also people now. So, and uh, kind of going back to the whole soundtrack, you said that people wanted the soundtrack uh, option. What were the considerations for music and soundtrack choice at the time? Like, did you have a hand in uh, what music was played, or was that more so in TV? Um, so MTV was not involved. Uh, I mean, we certainly had access to MTV's library um, on the American version of the show because there are, you know, just just like there's a, a Canadian Rocco, uh, there's also a, can, you know, a, a, the Canadian soundtrack that everybody's familiar with is different than the soundtrack that aired on MTV. Uh, MTV, we were able to use a lot of songs because MTV has this deal where if, you know, if, if an artist, a song is, is, is playing in a music video on their channel, that same song can be utilized in the soundtrack of their other shows. Oh wow! Um, so, so we had a lot. We had a, a very large library to choose from on the American side. Uh, on the Canadian side, um, we had to come up with other options and license, you know, tracks from from various artists. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a, a, an excellent uh, music supervisor on the show, who um, would basically just give me tons and tons of, of compilation CDs that he had, you know, piled. You know, compiled together of various artists, various songs, all of different genres, and basically said, so just, you know, basically make a list of the ones you like, and then we'll figure out where to put them into episodes. Uh, and that's really how the process went for selecting songs for, on the Canadian side. And you know, frankly, I think the Canadian version is better. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a far more eclectic and 
you know, it, it fits it fits more with the with the style of the show than some of the, the the tracks we chose on the MTV side. Oh, for sure. There's always a, a music presence that's in the background of the show, and something I uh, never really noticed until I really started uh, researching the show was that you guys could have characters talking and songs with lyrics playing at the same time, and yet the two would flow extremely well, which is in a very rare, rare case in most uh, most filmmaking aspects. Uh, on the choice of the theme, was it your choice to choose the Good Charlotte song? So, uh, you know, the, uh, the original pilot that I had done for MTV while the show was in development, I had a, a Blink-182 song in the, uh, in the, you know, mock-up opening that I had put together. And so I definitely wanted that kind of, you know, punk vibe, um, and we were looking at different bands to do the show's opening, and I think at one point we were, we were looking at uh, Sum 41, and uh, MTV, um, I, I think they put our pilot in front of Good Charlotte and said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing this, this song? And so before we could really pursue it any further, Good Charlotte came back to us and, with a song that they had written based on our pilot. Um, and that blew me away, because it was like, our show had, you know, had really only just been greenlit. It was obviously, obviously, it wasn't something that was on TV or known. It was, it was, it was about to go into production, and this band had written a, a, a theme song specifically based on, you know, the content of the pilot we had put together. You know, they referenced Obi Wan Kenobi and, uh, you know, a couple other story points from the pilot. Um, so that was just like, okay, that was this is a done deal. In Charlotte, <laughs> it is. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of how that happened. Have you, uh, well, once the Kickstarter is completed, do you have a thought of possibly contacting any of the band members to see if they want to do a revitalized version of it or if they want to have any kind of contribution to the movie at all? Yeah, I mean, the soundtrack for this movie is, you know, uh, is very important to me. I know that was a huge part of, of what made the show uh, memorable for fans. Uh, so putting together a really kick-ass soundtrack uh, is 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 you know, at the top of my list. Um, of course, it's going to depend on the budget, uh, and that's why you know, I do think even with this Kickstarter campaign, as we get further along, we're probably going to introduce some sort of stretch goals in there that that specifically have to do with the soundtrack, um, because we do we do want to be able to license you know uh, a variety of, of, of songs and, and and work with with a number of different bands. But to your to your question, absolutely, I'd love to reach out to some of the original bands that were featured. You know, because we do have. You know, a number of them were featured in more than one episode. We had you know, a few different songs from, from particular bands uh, that we really liked. Um, and then as far as Good Charlotte, um, I, you know, I, I don't know how we can do this movie without at least having that theme in there. Even of if course. it's like more at, the, at an instrumental level incorporated into the score of the movie, um, I would definitely like to be able to license that. The one thing that was so cool about the soundtrack was it was a mix of both Canadian and American artists. Um, are you you're gonna gonna focus on that kind of that uh, bringing those two together again? And you also said that there's limitations, obviously. And this is purely from a friend, uh, a work friend. His name is Curtis. He's asking, are you would you consider any up and coming kind of indie talent? Uh, in Canada or America, specifically his band XIX. <laughs> hey, Curtis guy. Uh, yeah. Um, well, because honestly, at the time when we were putting the soundtrack for the show together, uh, a lot of the bands that that ended up in the show were indie bands. They were up and coming. They, they, you know, I mean, we certainly had a few that that were that had hit and then you know were were, were successful and popular. But there were a lot that were, were relatively un unknown and undiscovered. So. Um, that would be my preference, and, and you know, open it up to, uh, to you know, to, to as many bands as possible that uh, that are looking for you know, looking for some exposure. Ooh, I'll let him know. <laughs> uh, something that I know, obviously, you talk. Uh, we've talked about how the technology and the the culture of the early two thousands is kind of a a crossroad right now for you in terms of how you bring that back, or if you bring that back into the movie. The other concern or thought I had was, because the show was made when it was, there's a bit of crude humor that was great, but admittedly now might not kind of form well with new culture and safe 
workplace dynamics, mainly a lot of what Rocco said. <laughs> Uh, but are you feel, do you feel that you're going to try and keep that same crude humor style in, in the movie that the show was so well known for? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing is, the, the, the crude humor, even back then, it's not like any of that humor was acceptable. Uh, but it, it came from a character like Rocco, who everybody considered to be, you know, a jackass and would point out the fact that what he was saying was, was dickish and, and unacceptable. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think as long as we come at it from that same point of view that, yeah, look, character's going to say some awful crude things in here, um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cross the line sometimes, but that is not the point of view of the main character of this show, and there, there will always be that voice of reason that kind of says, not cool guy. Oh, for sure. Probably one of the best, worst jokes that Rocco made was the crappy date rape joke. That joke is like, ooh, it's so bad, but at the same time, it is absolutely hilarious. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one's that one's touchy. <laughs> uh, I mean, it wasn't. You know, it was it was crossing the line back then, but uh, now it's a, it's like, ooh, certainly ooh. To, in today's climate, it is. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that one would get past the standards. Of oh no, system. definitely not. Well, that's kind of the whole. Uh, that's the early two thousands in a nutshell. There's a lot of movies and TV shows and other media culture that came out of that time that you would not get allowed now. Like, Scary Movie is another massive example. Uh, that movie could not be made today with the amount of very, very insensitive jokes that it had in it. Oh, for sure, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, I feel that you know, comedy is, is, is the opportunity for you to at least touch on those those touchy subjects uh again as long as it's done for, done in a in a in the spirit of uh you know shining light on on some of those issues as opposed to endorsing them then uh you know i'm all for it exactly now uh, the kickstarter has started and you say this is uh, a means to fund the first uh, first phase of pre-production what for those of us who don't understand are kind of non familiar with film and animation sort of uh, constructions uh, terms? What does that mean, and how if the first phase is successful, how much longer of a process would there be until uh, the movie is completed? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean the pre production would basically consist of writing the script, um, you know, putting together the storyboards, uh, assembling the staff. Uh, auditioning for uh, you know, any new supporting roles, um, you know, new featured character designs, of which, <laughs> of which after this Kickstarter campaign, there's going to be a lot, um, because that's one of the rewards. Uh, but uh, you know, the other goal with this Kickstarter campaign, on top of that, of, of raising these pre-production funds, is to you know show investors and distributors that there is still an audience that will support this project. So that's why. You know, we're really hoping to surpass our fundraising goal because the more donors we can show uh, that you know that, that have donated, the stronger our case will be when we go to someone like a Netflix or a Hulu or you know or anywhere we we try to secure distribution for this thing. Um, but uh, to, to answer the second part of your question, uh, in terms of time frame, um, it's it's really just going to depend on how long it takes us to secure uh, distribution for the film after the Kickstarter campaign. Um, because that's that's really what's going to allow us to move into production. So pre-production can begin, you know, as soon as Kickstarter ends, assuming we meet our goal. But uh, the actual production uh, will will definitely require uh, that, that distribution money. Ah, and, and speaking of which, there's a plug for you there. For those of you listening, if you want to see Undergrads come back as a movie, make sure to check out Undergrads the movie in the Kickstarter search uh, area. And donate if you want to, because it's a, there are some awesome prizes on there. So unfortunately, Pete, we're actually coming to the end of the interview. So I only have, I've got one more question for you. The task of trying to squeeze a subsequent second season idea down into a feature-length movie must be obviously a daunting kind of challenge. What are your primary primary focuses with the film in terms of narrative and fan service? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think you know certainly the big, <laughs> the big story plot that every, that left everybody hanging is like, what's going to happen next with, with Nitz and Jesse and and the Kimmy love triangle 
and you know how how does that get wrapped up and that's certainly something that we we want to wrap up in this movie uh even though the movie only takes place over the course of the first week at school um and you know we're going to see what happens with the other characters as well but the 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 nitz jesse storyline is is certainly the 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 loose thread that was left hanging there at the end of season one of course well, Pete, thank you again for coming on the show. Uh, this has been an interview that we've been long in the building, and I'm fine. I'm happy that we finally got to talk, despite weird technical issues today, and uh, just uh, the kind of organizing our schedule. So again, I, I very much appreciate you uh, coming on the show and giving undergrads fans a little bit of a heads up about yourself and the movie to come. No, thank you. This is a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, definitely check out the Kickstarter page and check out our Facebook uh, group, the, the Big Bring Back Undergrads Facebook page. Yes, definitely. Make sure to check it out. I've already donated twice. I've had to, I've just found out that you, well, what was it when I first donated? I found out that you have to, you can only do one prize. You can only do one contra- contribution on an account. So I've already made one other account and I'm going to be making another one probably. <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> thanks you uh, everyone for tuning in to listening to the movies here we were interviewing undergrad show creator pete williams talking to him about the kickstarter for the undergrads revival movie you guys were listening to us on 101.7 civl radio and on www.civl.ca uh, we were reporting to you from the university of the fraser valley abbots for campus on the unceded and traditional territory of the stolo people i was your host jeremy And hope you guys all enjoyed the show. Thank you for listening. See you guys next week. Anyways, guys, that's the end of the interview. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, If you've watched all the way to here, Pete was a fantastic guy to talk to. He was really personable and just really funny guy. And I hope you guys enjoyed what we talked about. And again, again, going to do a little plug here. Uh, Please, if you have not donated yet or if you've not checked it out or not shared it, please check out the Kickstarter for the undergrads of the movie. We're already halfway there for this project becoming a reality. So we just need the remaining, what's it, like $50,000 now. And again, the success for this Kickstarter has been immense. So let's get it done and let's get the click back. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. I'll see you guys next time.